Nexus fits into Star Wars in a, in a funny way in the sense that if you look at the history of Western tropes in science fiction, the whole history of cowboys really starts in what we now call Texas. It's really a cowboy movie in space, so it totally relates to Texas. <laughs> Somebody who's like, oh, you're a Star Wars fan. Well, you weren't around whenever it first came out. I'm like, well, tell me, what was your experience? Like, what was your moment? These characters transcended so many generations. The way films now try to jump on that same bandwagon that Star Wars did, I don't see them being as successful as Star Wars was. With Star Wars, there's just so much to do. It's such an open world, you know, very, no pun intended, sandboxy, you know? As a kid, fell in love with R2-D2 and always wanted to have a robot of my own. Hello, R2, how are you? Oh, that's good to hear. I've become known as the Star Wars teacher. Class, class. Yes, yes. I'm one with the Force. The Force is with me! It's been exciting to use Star Wars in the classroom. The group's like Saber Guild, the 501st, Rebel Legion. They're incredibly important. They're so diverse. I come from so many backgrounds. I have like a Death Trooper, I have my Mando, I have a Stormtrooper. For whatever reason, I was like, no, you gotta do your Slave Leia. I really try to mimic what Carrie Fisher did for all her photos in the Slave Leia. I try to do the late poses just to really sell the uh, character. He doesn't care, he just wants to have fun. This is my happy place to go and relax and enjoy a love of something that I've had since I was a kid. You know, I see the evil at work at home. When I come home, I want to have a, a relaxing atmosphere. Texas is super big. It's the place where you can live, live your fandom. I feel Texas Star Wars fans are more passionate. Like, they always say everything's bigger in Texas. We go overboard on a lot of stuff. Now you're about to enter a galaxy far, far. I keep all the expensive stuff. My collection is quarter of a million dollars or more. It's always portrayed as maybe guys being the fans, but there's actually a lot of female fans. It's a microcosm of what the world could be like if we stopped looking at everybody through their identities. Star Wars has changed my life forever. What is up, Geeks and Geekettes? It's a very special edition of the Countdown City Geek Cast. My name is Ted, a.k.a. Steady, and joining me is the one and only Retro Ray. What's going on, guys? We're going to have some more fun again today. Absolutely. And if you haven't heard, we got a very special guest with us. Uh, he is the director and the founder of the In the Lone Star Wars State documentary celebrating Star Wars fandom in the state of Texas, the one and only Alejandro Cabrera. What's going on, sir? What's up? How are you guys doing? Wonderful, wonderful. Thanks for asking. Um, you, my friend, you are doing fantastic. Uh, I'm sure you are just all over the place uh, mentally and physically because your documentary, which has been eight years in the making, is releasing in uh, less than a week and a half now. Um, so we're going to talk to you all about it. But first, I would love to hear from you um, just kind of where, where your mind's at. How are you feeling? Is it a little bit of relief, a little bit of uh, anxiety? How are you feeling today? It's it's all over. Uh, it's, it's, been <laughs> it's, uh, it's bittersweet. It's exciting because um, I think after all these years, it just feels like you've been... I don't know, like when you're working on something, it feels like it's an intimate relationship and it's only you and, and that experience. And I'm excited that, you know, finally get to share it with, with an audience and, and they get to see, uh, you know, all the wonderful things that, that have been going on. Um, but then there's that part of me that you get so used to. I mean, it's been eight years of, of my life. Uh, I could have been gone to high school twice. I could have been a doctor. I, right? <laughs> I 
yeah, college that. twice. Yeah. And um, I mean, most TV shows nowadays are four seasons, right? Right. Uh, oh, it, it's so crazy. I think there's been uh, four Fast and the Furious movies <laughs> to give you an idea. Um, but yeah, it's uh, I'm I'm so excited um, to release it. There's there's always a sense of nerves, and it's almost like putting together a wedding. Um, so that's kind of how it feels. It feels like I'm putting together a wedding and there's all these outside of the movie, there's all these things that, you know, have to fall into place and all these technical things. Um, and uh, the movie looks amazing. Right now I'm doing some final color correcting. And so it's literally down to the wire. I do not enjoy color correcting. So all power to you, sir. May Thank the force you. be with you in that regard. Thank For you. anyone who's not heard about this uh, incredible, ambitious documentary, please, in your own words, tell the folks at home exactly what is this uh, mission that you set yourself on. So In the Lone Star Wars State is about um, the, the Star Wars fandom in Texas from Houston, Austin, Dallas, San Antonio, even some little small towns, outskirt towns. But... Um, it, it's not just, um, it, you know, I feel like oftentimes when people hear of fandom documentaries, the way that this community is depicted is sort of like, you know, look how weird or, you know, it's kind of like the 40 year old version or something like that. It's really more about, uh, I think Star Wars is, is interesting because it's, we all know somebody that's a Star Wars fan or either we're a fan or we work with somebody and, um, it's sort of the idea of like anybody can be a Star Wars fan and, and these films affect people in different ways. And so I wanted to ultimately explore the question of what is it that makes somebody connect to Star Wars, right? And in our story, we meet several fans from all walks of life, all generations. Um, we meet uh, a wonderful fan by the name of Heather Trupia who is a elementary school teacher at a Title I school in Buda, Texas. And Title I school is basically a low socioeconomic school right. and very transient. And she uses Star Wars as a way to engage her students and to promote literacy. Uh, we meet also uh, a wonderful collector by the name of Chris Kelly from Dripping Springs in Austin, Texas. And his collection is so huge that they had to move from a two-story home in Austin, Texas, all the way to Dripping Springs to a big, very generous property to house wow. his entire time. Um, we meet a law enforcement agent by the name of Brian Goldstein, and uh, he's a member of the 501st Legion. And we, we did a ride along with him, and you see all the horrors that they see as law enforcement agents in the day and why, for him... Uh, being part of the 501st is important because it helps him take away his mind of things. And uh, we meet also um, uh, Tanner and Melissa King from, from Houston. Uh, they are a married couple who literally met in the 501st. He's in the military. He looks like uh, Chris, uh, what's his name from Guardians of the Galaxy? Um, Chris, Chris Pratt. Pratt. Chris Pratt meets uh, Chris Evans, uh, and if you see them, you would never assume that they are Star Wars fans, but their children's nursery rooms is Hoth themed. Uh, they do this thing where they gender swap costumes. He dresses up as Princess Leia. She dresses up as Han Solo. He's military. And what I loved about him and both of them is that he's sort of like, when you see him, you, you think of that idea of masculinity and all these things, but you know, they're sort of redefin redefining what fandom is. And um, I think, uh, you know, for, for such a long time, fandom has been depicted in a very um, stereotypical way. And sure. like, you, know, they live in, you live in mom's basements, you, you know, and it's, and it's, it's, we're all fans of something at some, in, in some point. And um, I think that I was, I was more interested in exploring, breaking those stereotypes and exploring you know, the, the realness of why people do what they do. I I love that. It's a fantastic mission that you set yourself on. And like you mentioned, um, getting to know 
maybe not to know, but maybe to understand, Star Wars fans can look like anyone, can come from anywhere, you know, come from different backgrounds, different walks of life, yet we're all, as you mentioned, sort of connected in a way. Um, my first question for you, my first actual question for you is, try and remember back. Yeah. When was it? When did Star Wars take over your life? When did you fall in love with a galaxy far, far away? Well, that that's the power of Star Wars. Star Wars is um, it's it's a it's an it's it's almost like a thumb uh, thumb tag to a very special moment in your childhood, specifically. And I remember it was it was late summer, nineteen ninety six. I was seven years old. I was transitioning from first grade to second grade. And um, my mother, uh, she's, she's a dentist and she had her own practice. And so the only day that we would get to um, actually spend time with her as a family was usually on Sundays. And uh, we would go to brunch and then we would go either to the movies or shopping. And I remember we my, one of my favorite stores was Suncoast Video Store. Uh, <laughs> I'm giving away my age. Um, <laughs> and uh, we went to Suncoast Video Store. And at the time, they had re-released the, the, the films on VHS, not yeah. the special. It was a year before the special editions. Okay. I think the, the 90, 1995 version, but, you know, it was the 90s. These movies would sit on the shelves for a while. And so she saw that there was a box set of VHS of Star Wars. And um, she bought them and she was playing them at home and she was trying to get my attention. And she says, look, look, that's Luke Skywalker. Uh, he has a twin sister like you uh, named Leia. I'm a fraternal twin. And, uh, and then she said, um, and look, that's Darth Vader, uh, just like your father. My, my parents were divorced. So any, any chance she got to throw a jab at him, she would. <laughs> that, that makes you Luke, right? Yes, well, I'd say my 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 mother is more Darth Vader. My father is my father is a saint. My father is Obi Wan. <laughs> All right. But so that was my introduction, and and um, I remember the following spring, the special editions were being re released, and my father hates science fiction, but he was very kind and very generous, and he sat through it with us. So I think that it was every two weeks or every three weeks they would release one. And um, I remember watching it and uh, I just, I fell in love with it. I think when I think of Star Wars, I don't think so much about the movies. Mm. I think about the time in which I was introduced to them. And that time was so pure. Um, and it's, it's so crazy. There's very few movies in this world that have the ability of transporting you, like almost like you're there and you remember everything about it. Um, so I think that's what makes these films so personal. Absolutely. So me and Alejandro go pretty back far. Um, I met him when he was doing a previous documentary and he videotaped me for it, which I kind of was nervous as hell to do. Um, so you said I did okay. I never pictured tables would be reversed today where now I'm interviewing him. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, he he's a cool guy. When I met him the first time, he he has people customize his clothes. Like, he loves what he loves. I mean, he had, um, when I first met him, he had, uh, I think it was a shining sweater that you had it made that yeah. someone made it for you. Um, but yeah, when you like something you actually go all out yeah i mean and i know in the documentary you do the same thing and you actually had somebody make you the darth maul jacket as well for the thing and i, I think there's some other stuff too i'm not too sure i haven't seen everything but i'm pretty sure there's other stuff you had made um after that one documentary you made you transitioning to the star wars one where did you want to like what was it that triggered you to say, you know what, I want to do this. This hasn't been done. And you mentioned that, you know, you've been doing this for eight years. Is it been hard to try to 
because there's so much to do, so much to take in, so much. And that's one thing you did mention to me is that you have so much stuff to edit. If you want to keep everything in there, but it's so hard because there's so much you've taped throughout the years. Um, how you juggled what you're going to keep in and what you're having to edit out. Is it kind of, are we going to have like, this is what was put out. Or are we going to have a special edition where you have deleted scenes <laughs> and stuff so, like that? Yeah. Kind of like Taylor Swift, Taylor's version, uh, Taylor's version. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, yeah. So what, it, what, in, what inspired me to go on this journey, it was actually in 2015. Um, it was, I had literally, so Sci-Fi Tonians, which was my first full-length documentary, um, we premiered it. it. It came out, I believe it was, we premiered it uh, August 30th, 2015. And then we put it online on YouTube on September 6th, I think, 2015. But that summer, um, obviously that whole year, 2015, revolved around the release of The Force Awakens. You remember November 2014, Right before Thanksgiving, we got that first teaser trailer, which we just we got the the first image of BB-8, John Boyega and um, Daisy Ridley, and that was it. And then fast forward April of 2015, we we got our first shot of um, Harrison Ford and uh, and Chewbacca inside of the Millennium Falcon. And so that whole year revolved around the release of Star Wars: The Force Awakens. You got to remember there had there hadn't been a Star Wars movie. Uh, as we know it, since May 19, 2005. And so there was this infuse of excitement. And, and Star Wars is unlike, again, like unlike any other movie. Um, it's, it's an event. It's, it's an experience. And um, there was this excitement. And I recognized that it was something that was very historical um, because every generation has their own Star Wars um, thing that defined them. My generation is the prequel generation. And of right. course, I love, <laughs> I love them. That's very controversial. I love them. <laughs> There's and, no controversy. They're amazing. They're, yeah, yeah. They're good. End and of I discussion. <laughs> um, uh, yes, you know, there's, there's moments that are camp, but that's what makes it fun. Um, and so I recognize that there's something historical. And I think um, there was this desire in me. I always had this, um, fantasy about traveling back in time to 1977 to experience it, how it happened, and what was it like walking into the toy store and what was it like watching it for the first time. And um, I was like, well, what if I capture this moment? So with you doing that and going into it and being able to film fans reactions from all the upcoming movies and the happy fans and non-happy fans, I bet that was kind of different. You weren't expecting to have fans come out of the theater and each of them having some of them not being happy and some being happy. So I think um, the the interesting thing is that when people usually go to the theaters and they leave the theater, they're, you haven't really formed an opinion. You're still trying to process whatever it is that you saw. And, and yeah. that's like, Sometimes you talk to friends and you go to a movie and they say, oh, I loved it. And then like the next day, oh, that movie was bad. It's like, wait a minute, you loved it. And it's your, your mind is thinking. <laughs> so when, I, when I saw the last, when I went to The Last Jedi and, um, and I interviewed people before and after, people, there, was, there were no negative um, comments, right? A lot of people were praising it. It was after when I was later interviewing people you know, in their homes or after some time where there were some, they were able to digest and process everything. And there were some, everybody for the most part was nice, right? But everybody obviously recognized that there was, there was some opportunity. Um, but I think the most interesting thing is seeing the contrast between the release of The Force Awakens and all the way to The Rise of Skywalker. And the yeah. movie... It's night and day. The movie theater on The Force Awakens, it was it was a party. It was it was all about what was happening in that lobby. Everybody was festive, even people that had never seen Star Wars. Every it was an it was an exciting experience. And fast forward to the Rise of Skywalker, um, it was weird. It was just and I, I've compared I've compared the footage. 
bridge. It was weird. It was like, it was just like a Star Wars movie dropped and there were people there, but that excitement was not there. It wasn't as full as it as I was expecting it to be. And it was almost like it came and it went. Um, and I think one of the, one of the interesting things that, um, that we, through filming that I, that I found out about was that the Rise of Skywalker was the last blockbuster to come out as we know it. Because you remember this was December 2019. Right. Uh, that's usually where summers and, and holidays is when blockbusters come out. And then of course in the spring we had COVID. And so that was the last blockbuster to come out before everything that happened. Um, yeah. And we, we talked a little bit about it um, because Star Wars is a part of that era in the 70s where you had young filmmakers like um, William Friedkin and you had uh, Steven Spielberg, Mark, Martin Scorsese, and they were all part of that era of, um, you know, it was almost like uh, young filmmakers striking back and making films that were, you know, realistic and dealt with everyday issues, were anti-Vietnam. And prior to that, you know, you had Hitchcock and, you know, directors were in a suit and it was very elitist and it was a very different mentality and there were certain topics that they wouldn't touch on and and it was that that mentality that um that created the blockbuster you know mm. people line up for hours and um movie theaters were an experience and it's so interesting everything that's happened since the pandemic where more studios are streaming. The movie theater, the movie uh, release time went from, I think it was a 60 day, a 90 day window, which is three mm -hmm. months, to now it's a 45 day window. It's crazy. And, you know, it's crazy. So it's affected the, the movie theater industry because a lot of people would rather wait for streaming. Yeah. Uh, and uh, rather than go and watch it at the movies, um, movie theaters are you know, the truth is that they're struggling, um, even though they've had a few hits here and there. Um, and so it's, it's, it's really interesting seeing how, again, the role that Star Wars still continues to play in history and, and in the current times of the world. Definitely. You, um, you know, you set out on this ambitious, like I mentioned earlier, ambitious documentary. Um, what were some of the challenges you faced? I know it was a very long production and a, lo a long process and a ton of research, right? You're going out there trying to find almost like needles in a, a Texas-sized haystack. Right. Uh, what, what are some of the, the unique challenges that you faced making this film? So I'd say, um, gosh, there were, there were so many uh, challenges and obstacles. Um, it, I wore many different hats. Uh, I think like Ray mentioned, um, one of the things that we do in the story is, um, you know, I felt that just because it's a documentary, it should not, not be entertaining. I, right. I think documentaries can be in, informative, but they can also be entertaining. And so in, in understanding that, um, I, uh, I kept thinking about Madonna and I kept thinking about um, artists, Michael Jackson and people when they perform a song, they wear wardrobe, right? And so I always said, if I'm going to be on camera, I have to be wearing something that uh, is sort of further illustrates the narrative, but also gives maybe a wink at the fans or, you know, the, oh, the, oh, wow, he's wearing that. Wait a minute. I know what that is. Um, and so, um, my wonderful dear friend, Stephanie Dowd, uh, brought to life a lot of the sketches that I would make that Darth Maul, uh, jacket was one of them. Um, I was going to be interviewing Heather Trupia, who's a, a teacher at the elementary school, and she's part of Saber Guild, which they are, um, a nonprofit organization. They dress up as Jedi and, um, Sith. And, uh, and I said, okay, well, this is my version of a Sith. And so I went with the sort of collegiate, uh, punk inspired, uh, uh, Darth Maul. And I wore that. And then of course I, I wear this beautiful, I don't know if you guys remember the tops trading cards from the 1980s. I, yeah. I, went, I just, I, through my research, I found out that there were these cool cards. And so I love the rapper and, uh, we made a coat, uh, inspired by one of the rappers. Wow. wow. 
That's awesome. There's, there's a lot of fun uh, fashion moments in it, but it was, I was like, I wanted to make it fun and different. Um, in terms of, there, there were challenges in that too, in, in constructing a lot of that, that stuff. Um, I mean, I, gosh, I think there, there were so many challenges and obstacles. Uh, I mean, there's, there's challenges right now. <laughs> <laughs> Um, because it's, it's obviously it's, I've had to film, direct, edit, book, yeah. uh, talent and everything. And, um, you know, I, I wear towards the end, I've had some help with, uh, from, from a few friends, like Ray, you met Greg, uh, yeah. right. Um, but it is, it is a challenge. I think that's something that people don't realize is that, um, you know, when you travel, you know, you have to pay for hotel fees. There's um, travel expenses. There's gas. There's camera equipment. Um, there, I mean, I, I had nights where I cried myself to sleep because I was trying to figure out something and how do you do this and how do you do that? And um, you question yourself like, you know, am I, am I silly for even doing this? Should I even, am I, am I wasting my time? You know what I mean? Because you, you, you tell people about it and some people are like, oh, that's cute. You know, <laughs> like, oh, 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 that's cute. Like, you want to be a, a, a filmmaker. And I don't consider myself a, a filmmaker. I'm a storyteller. I love to tell stories. You know, I tell jokes with my friends and we tell stories. And this is a story that is happens to be told publicly. Um, but yes, there were many obstacles, many challenges. Um, but I think that's the beauty of all of it is nothing came easy but nothing that is truly worth it ever does and in a way I feel, I, I feel like i had um my own hero's journey you know throughout this experience and and um to have made had, had made it this far i'm uh i'm very very proud and very excited awesome yeah so am i i mean seeing some of the stuff that you teased on you know instagram and facebook one of the things that you had posted a while back was you actually recreated the cantina scene up in Dallas. And to me, it looked so authentic just from seeing in the photos. I was like, oh, that is so cool. I can't wait to see that in the documentary. And then also getting to work with you about a couple of weekends ago. It's so weird. I've never been behind the scenes of camera filming and stuff like that and studio sets. But some of that stuff, you know, helping put, you know, the trash compactor scene together mm -hmm. it's it's so hard to imagine when you look at it through a photo or stuff like that it looks so real but what's behind it is it's different and seeing you work and doing what you did that day was so cool like i enjoyed it i mean we were there for at least four to five hours yeah and, yeah you know what i mean and i don't know how much actually out of all that you actually keeping in the film but it was i enjoyed just sitting there watching it take place because i have never seen something like that before where did your love for document or not day documentary get filming come from i mean i've always loved um i think films are are such a important part of life and i love the idea of of going to the cinema and you you get to you get lost in that experience and it's almost like a almost like going to church you know i think feel like i get more out of it than going to church physically um and you're there and you're away from everything that's part of your everyday life your phone your problems your everything and and you're able to take away something from that experience even if it's a horror movie there's something that you take away from that and you're able to see a different perspective and it changes you whether even if the movie sucks it changed you because you're like wow that was that was horrible <laughs> uh, but I, I think films are so important and they're so inspirational and they're a part of everyday life and i think we need them because there's something aspirational about them we all connect with a character with a storyline you know and um i think that that um that we learn and so to me i've always recognize the power of the platform. I love telling stories. Um, I love the idea of capturing a particular moment. Uh, in terms of my favorite uh, genre, I love documentary because unlike, um, I mean, I love everything watching. I love watching everything myself, but in terms of the type of stuff that I like to work on, I like documentary because it's real. 
it's real stories, it's real people. And, um, you know, Superman is amazing and Luke Skywalker is amazing, but at the end of the day, they are fictional characters, right? There's life lessons that we can learn from them. But in documentaries, these are real people, these are real lives, and you know that what they're going through. And, and we see some stories uh, in, in this experience. Uh, we, we have some, some, we have some exciting conversations, but we see some everyday life struggles unfold on camera. And we have some, some very, very hard conversations. And th these were things that I'd never in my life imagined that I was gonna be talking about on camera uh, with some of the subjects. And I, I feel like if, you're, if you see somebody real going through something real, and you're going through something, it's almost like a DIY video from YouTube where you're like, okay, they went through this and they got through this and, yeah. and maybe I can get through this too. And I think now more than ever, we need stories that are positive and stories that are in inspiring. Um, specifically in a world where, uh, you know, the world has changed so drastically and, and every day there's something whether it be political or it be, you know, all the all the unfortunate stuff that's, that's going across, uh, happening right now with the war and, and stuff like that. Um, I think we also need to remember that uh, we need to remember hope and we need to remember the power of uh, that there's great things in this world and that we can get through anything. So those are the stories that I like to tell. Nice. I love it. Um... And this current day that we're living in, this current world that we're living in, uh, our differences are pointed out to us, you know, quite mm -hmm. frequently. And uh, people will find, you know, reasons to differentiate themselves from another group or another class. Or And what you're doing is, is not only, you know, putting out an inspiring message, but it's reminding folks we do have a lot in common. Yeah. And we can all celebrate this together and it doesn't, um, you know, we don't always have to just look at what makes us different, but, uh, you know, share and celebrate some of the things that um, make us the same. I think that but, was, that was, uh, it was almost accidental. Um, I, you know, I just started interviewing all kinds of people. Um, I'm a millennial. I interviewed people that were in my same generation, but then I interviewed people from other generations, other age groups, other financial brackets. Believe it or not, there's people in the story that I've talked to that have completely different political views than mine. Yeah. But the beautiful thing about it was that it didn't matter where we stood. Um, our love for Star Wars uh, and our passion for Star Wars was strong enough that it didn't matter, you know, or even if we had different, we came from different generations or we meet a few women in the story. And I thought that that was so cool. Um, the, the beautiful thing was seeing how, how much we are alike than how much we are divided. And it, it's interesting because Star Wars really was designed as a children's film. And uh, I mean, I, I get to see another film out there that is so unifying. And whether you like or hate one movie or the other, we all like Star Wars as a whole. Um, right. We like something about it. Right. And that it still continues to unite people from all walks of life. I, I think, I mean, I don't know. I, they should study that in a lab or something because <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's a secret there to that. And, and, and again, not many films um, have, have had the ability of connecting that. So... Um, I thought that that was very powerful. It should be studied. There's, there's got to be a, a university somewhere that has a course on, you know, Star Wars fandom and its popularity. It's got to be out there somewhere. Uh, real quick, just to kind of tease the folks at home, this is that set that Ray was referring to earlier. Uh, so if you'd like to, it just kind of, this is so detailed. I love it. It looks amazing. Um, how fun was it just to, I assume this is just a quick, either short um, portion of your film. Um, you know, what, how'd you come up with this idea and how well did it turn out compared to what you were considering or thinking about in your mind? 
So it all started uh, last year. Uh, we were filming the intro to the movie, right? And I, I didn't just want to be sitting somewhere or like in a movie theater. I was like, I want this to be epic. Again, going back to like performance, right? I want this to be epic, uh, epic. So many of the conversations in the movie, you know, you're seeing real life, you're seeing real people. And I wanted the, I wanted the intro to be almost like a, a big epic thing, like get ready, buckle up. And so we filmed um, with these um, Death Star wall panels. It was about four panels in the background. And I'm coming in and there's stormtroopers and they're turning. And I was inspired by the opening of A New Hope when Darth Vader walks through the through the rebel ship. And, um, and I was like, wow, this was so much fun. And in the movie, we have um, about six segments and each segment talks about a specific topic in fandom, right? There's one that's dedicated to collectors. There's one that's dedicated to the, the, the films and, and the, the sequel trilogy and, and, and the change that Star Wars had on those films. Sure. There's one that's dedicated to filmmakers and there's one about um, fandom. And so uh, for that one, uh, the, the garbage uh, compactor, um, that's the intro to the, the fandom organization's segment. And so I just kept thinking about, okay, like that scene in A New Hope, they're not really stormtroopers. They, they're wearing this armor that they got and i was like wow like wouldn't it be like that that's a great visual statement to make uh and um and i just love the idea of the garbage compactor again like how do you film that like when people see that <laughs> they're going to lose their minds like how did you do that and it looks i mean i i finished the 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 editing and it looks amazing uh we did have the 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 monster there the monster yeah we did have it and uh uh, it, it it looks similar to the scene from the movie. And so that was used uh, as a set to introduce the, the fandom organizations. And uh, we talk about make-believe and, and the importance of, uh, it's not just kids that are dressing up, but adults are dressing up. And these are adults that are dressing up for, for good and for charity. And so we had fun and, and, um, and, uh, and, and Ray uh, makes a cameo there. <laughs> Do you remember that, Ray? Yeah, it, like I said, it was a fun day. Wasn't expecting that. I was expecting us to go there, do a quick little interview with you. I did not expect anything that happened that day. Yeah. And it, it was just fun. To me, I had a great day there helping you guys set up, helping you guys break down. It, it, to me, it was just a fun day. It was like a kid in a candy store. That's how I felt. <laughs> but that was just icing on a cake that you actually put me and David a little – little scene in there which is pretty cool no i was like i have to put you guys in there um but it was it was a tiny set as you saw it was it's very tiny but um the way it was filmed it looks like it's um it, i mean you you will think you were at the, you were you're inside of the garbage uh compactor <laughs> yeah it's I, gonna, it. I can't wait i can't wait to see that because like i said when you're seeing it and you're setting it up you know knowing what it's made of and then once you put it up and then you're actually taking pictures and video yeah it looks so authentic i mean the guy what was his name again greg 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 Rice. greg yeah he does awesome work putting it together i mean if you guys knew what was on the floor and how everything was set up in the background it just looked like if you were actually on the star wars set you know well, once it was put together this played a big role but uh, i i gotta give credit to lucas dooley uh, who he built that, um, he built it in one week. Oh my God. He built it in, and, uh, we, we, we are, we are doing a behind the scenes documentary that shows all that stuff. Wow. Uh, he built it in one week. He brought it all the way from, from, um, Fort Worth to San Antonio and all that stuff was stuff that he had in the shop. And, um, yeah, we just, we did it. Uh, it was, uh, four hours. And I think that intro is only about um, two minutes. <laughs> so, the magic of filmmaking. Yes. Um, what have you learned from this documentary? Whether it's about f storytelling, 
whether it's about fandoms, uh, whether it's um, about something specific or unique to one of your interview interviewees in the film, what's what's something that it, you learned and that has l left a lasting impression on you? Gosh, there's there's so many things that I've um, that I've taken away from this experience. I think one of them for me um, was uh, I'm originally from Puerto Rico. I moved here in 2001 when I was 12 to San Antonio, and um, you know my childhood was something that I have very fond memories of. And moving here, I did have a great childhood, but you know growing up there and you know the summers were different and the experiences were different. And um, it was so interesting because obviously. I hadn't thought about Star Wars, um, you know, after, after Revenge of the Sith, you know, I was in high school, I was in 10th grade when the movie came out and the movie came out and it just almost felt like you just shut your, that door in your, to your childhood, right? And of course, every once in a while you would pop them on the DVD or, or when the Blu-rays were, were released and, and were released for the first time in 2011, you'd watch it. Um, but then getting to go on this journey and it was almost like further dissecting my childhood and getting the opportunity to, because you also go there emotionally and mentally, you revisit a lot of memories and experiences. And it was interesting, I was gonna be filming in Dallas in summer 2019. And I find out that um, one of my really good childhood friends, uh, someone who was a neighbor of mine in Puerto Rico, him and his then fiance, now wife, moved to Dallas. He was, uh, he was, he's a dentist and she's some other type of doctor. And I found out that they were living in Dallas. And so I was like, okay, I don't know anybody in Dallas. So the day before fil uh, filming one of the interviews, we got together and it was so crazy. We hadn't seen each other in nine years since college. And, um, it was like no time had passed and we kept talking about our childhood. And so it was almost like method filmmaking in a way, because I'm, even stepping further into those nostalgic memories of childhood. And when I think of Star Wars really is like going outside and playing with, you know, my neighbors and my friends. And uh, it was such a great experience that um, uh, I went to Dallas to film uh, the teaser trailer for the movie. And the teaser, I wanted it to feel like those 90s teasers where it's almost like a short film. And so we, inspired by the, the idea of the blockbuster, we filmed outside of the Texas theater, which is where they found uh, the individual that murdered Kennedy. And um, so we filmed outside of there. And uh, I told my friend, I was like, hey, like, can you just be an extra? Can you just walk in the back? And it's like, not only will I walk, but I'll talk. And I was like, okay, perfect. So I put him inside of the, the box office uh, oh, as wow. a, a ticket person. We dressed them up in like a red vest and everything. And it was so cool because even though people watch it, they don't know who he is. To me, it was almost like he is the the gatekeeper to my childhood. Wow. And so it felt very meta, just putting yeah. him in there. And it was like, gosh, like we're two kids from Puerto Rico and we're here and and you know, it was just so I got to reconnect with my childhood and and I, I didn't realize how much I needed that. And, you know, you become an adult and you almost feel like you have to become this person. And there were a lot of wounds and things that I missed. And I felt that I, it was almost like I had ignored because I, you know, when, a, when a memory is so good that you feel so bad because you don't have it anymore. And every time you think about it, instead of joy, it gives you sadness. So I sort of locked away all of those memories of childhood whenever I moved to San Antonio and going on this journey, it was almost like I was forced to revisit a lot of that. And in a way, I found a part of myself um, back. I, I, I found an element of myself that I needed. And so in a way, it was a healing experience. But it also taught me, um, I think as an artist, creatively, I got to grow. I got to wear many different hats. Um, I got to meet people from all over the state of Texas. And it taught me to, to stick if, if you want something, if you love something, no matter how big or how small it is, stick with it and, and you will get through it. And I, and I think, again, we live in a world where 
we define success as um, money or uh, the car you or the house you drive. But to me, success is when you get to do something that you love, that you feel uh, you're connected to. And that really is the, the secret to success. And so I think I was very successful on this journey. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think I, I learned to stick through something no matter how hard or how crazy it, it, it may seem or how ambitious it may seem. And it's interesting, um, a year ago uh, with the intros, that, that was something that we left to towards the end. I would have thought there were a lot of things that I did in this movie that would have been impossible. Like, how are we going to do this? Like, that's impossible. Like, how are we going to do this documentary? And it's almost like working out, right? The first few weeks are hard, yeah. but then you do it and you're lifting and it's like, you're working out your mind and that ability of like, I can do this. And it's almost like it becomes taken nature. So whatever you go after, it's just like, okay, let's do this. And, and it, it's, it's so crazy. It happened a lot towards the end of like, I want to do this. Okay. And you just figure it out. And it's like, wait a minute. I didn't have to think too much about it. Like the cantina, the, the cantina was another one. I was like, how am I going to, and it just, it happened. And then this last one is like, bam, it just, it, it came from, from wherever it needed to come. That is amazing. It was, um, therapeutic, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, the entire process. I love that. That's wonderful. Yeah. I, and that's I, the thing you, you did it, what you loved. And at the end of the day, it opened your mind up to now. I'm pretty sure you're probably somewhat planning what you want to do next as well with that. With, with this project or, or future projects, future projects. Cause you did, you did this. So now I'm pretty sure you're thinking, yes. what can I do next? So I am thinking about, uh, there's a few things that I'm playing around with next. It, it won't be, um, unless Lucasfilm calls me and they say, we want to <laughs> Um, it won't be uh, Star Wars or, or I think fandom related. Um, I, yes, I thought about what I want to do next. Um, but I'm not, uh, I think for the first time in my life, I'm not stressing out about it. In the past, it was always like, you had to know what was next. I feel like I've worked so hard these last eight years and I just want to be present and enjoy it. And, and just, you know, cause you work so hard. You're like, you know what? I baked the cake. I want to eat it too now. <laughs> but yes, there, there are um, there are a few things that I uh, that I that I would like to do next, um, but nothing that I'm like, this is the direction that that I want to go. I want I want to, it has to come. I think um, ideas are things that you have to they speak to you, and you have to let them come to you, and they'll. They'll manifest them. They'll, they'll, they'll let you know how they want to manifest themselves. You know, do they want to be, you know, is it a documentary? Is it a, a even a, a film or, you know, um, so that's what I'm, I'm excited about. Uh, I, I can't wait for it to come to me next and tell me this is what I want, what it, what I, how I want to be uh, revealed. So we're looking yeah. for the In, signs basically. Yes. Yeah. In, inspiration can come from anywhere. Yes. But also it's meeting the right people and, and right. getting in that circle. Cause it's kind of weird. The signs are there. It's a small world. If you stop and look at things and this is the thing we we're so busy. We don't look at the little things. Right. I met you years ago. You told me, Hey, you did pretty good on the camera. Um, <laughs> yeah. And well, not only that it, you, that was one little sign there. You telling me that, and I was like, yeah, whatever. I don't like being in front of the camera. I don't like taking pictures. Then I meet Ted, and then Ted tells me the same thing. He's, you need to get in front of the camera. You need to be. I was like, I always like being behind the scenes. Yeah. But same thing like you, Ted literally created Countdown to the Geek Cast because this, this was something that he liked to do. But I'm pretty sure, like, the two of you, the people who looked at you guys when you, you just said, hey, this is what I'm going to do. People kind of like you said, people were like, oh, they kind of gave you that. Oh, that's oh, cool. That's cool. But I mean, what Ted's created, what you've done, you know, I think you guys stepped out of the box. You did what you loved and you have this to show for it. And and that's why I said, you know, you got to look at the signs when you surround yourself with a good team. 
you can accomplish anything that you set your goals to. And that's why, like, it was, like I said, it's a small world. It goes circles, me getting to work with you again and now getting to enjoy what you have done. It's so cool because I never would have thought, you know, 10 years ago, we would be right here now. You know what I mean? But like I said, I'm looking forward to your documentary. Can't wait to see what other stuff you work on. But yeah, that's pretty much how I feel on that. I, I appreciate it. Uh, it's so crazy uh, how the world turns. And I mean, I remember we met in, gosh, I want to say it was, <laughs> um, I think it was, it, it was around no, November. No, it was late September, early October, 2014. Yeah. You were getting ready to plan a comic book release um, yes. at your previous, uh, where you used to work. And uh, I remember, I remember uh, when I met you and, and uh, yeah, it, it's so crazy how the world shifts and turns. Fate, destiny. Fate. Yes, yes. Well, Ted, you don't know this and you won't know this until you see it. Uh-oh. But when he was there at the the filming for the first Force Awakens for the, I think it was a marathon they were doing. Yes. When, when you're right behind David, when David has the lightsabers, yeah, he was there filming the crowd. So you're probably oh. going to be in this documentary. Interesting. <laughs> when when it was pointed out to me, because, oh wait a minute, that was that was you, and and that does happen. People are like, oh that was me. It's like, oh wait a minute, like that was you. So it's because you always wonder who these people are, you know. Uh, but yeah, the, the Force Awakens part, uh, that's pretty cool. You get to see the excitement in real time. Uh, we won't see it in this in this cut of the movie. Um, this cut of the movie is four hours. Um, wow. Originally, I wanted to release <laughs> it. goes fast. It's a, uh, it goes fast. I love long movies. I yeah. don't know what this generation <laughs> complains about these days. I grew up, you grew up when the Lord of the Rings movies were out and they were releasing the extended editions after a while. But yeah, so I'm not afraid of. I mean, I did the Star Wars marathon as you did, apparently. So yeah, yeah I'm not afraid to sit in the movie theater all day. So this is yes, yeah, so we were gonna see a four hour cut of the movie, and then in the spring, uh, late spring, we're releasing a chapter, a segment each week. Nice. It's not a show. Nice. It's just an entire documentary, but it's with within chapters, and um, and so the the theater segment that will be in the spring um but yeah i'm excited about that too in the lone star wars state the limited release is november 11th for tickets and information please go to eventbrite.com and search in the lone star wars state and you're also uh, showing the premiere at one of my favorite places in town, the Blue Star Complex. Yes, the brick. Yeah. yeah. I love they, it. They were so uh, they were so generous. You know, again, being an independent filmmaker, um, the way that movie theaters nowadays work is even if they want to show your movie, right? They have contracts with film studios. And so let's say Disney says, I want you to show Ant-Man uh, Quantumania, even though it flops, you have to have eight showings of it. And if you don't, we're going to pull any future Disney release films. Studios have to abide by that. I mean, yeah, uh, for sure. Theaters. theaters. And so uh, I was trying to, I was talking to a, a, a local venue here in San Antonio and, uh, you know, like we want to show it, but like this is, you know, this is the process and this is how things work. Um, I was uh, trying to work out something with a draft house and, you know, like now that they, they charge you uh, an arm and a leg <laughs> for, to show something. And uh, the brick was one of those venues that they were very open to it. Um, obviously they cater more to uh, young artists. Uh, you know, they, they do uh, showcasings of, you know, performances or, uh, paintings or music and so I, I love the venue it's it's beautiful it, it almost feels like um like a high-end uh, art gallery yeah art gallery without the the pretentiousness of it 
and uh, I feel like it's it's more intimate. Um, and so yeah, they were they were very kind. They're very generous, and um, and yeah, I, I, again, we're we're trying to. I want to sell out. <laughs> I feel like this is. Um, I, I feel like that that's you know we talked about challenges. Um, we we've sold a, a a decent acceptable amount of of tickets, but I feel like again today's world has gone so used to streaming or things going online, and so I feel yeah. like a lot of people are holding back on on that. And so you'll get sometimes questions like, well, why are you doing one showing? And it's like, well, because it costs every showing that you do. Um, so again, it's a beautiful story. Um, it's inspiring. I'm not just saying it because I'm in it or I made it. Um, I think that uh, it's a powerful story. Even if you're not a Star Wars fan, um, I think that people will be able to see themselves in this narrative. And um, I think that they'll be able to find inspiration in this narrative. Um, again, I just, I think it's, uh, it's it, it was a powerful experience for me. Nice. I completely agree. And if you're not a Star Wars fan and you want to try and understand just a little bit of what, you know, the Star Wars fans are all about, I feel that there's no better way to try and do that than watching a film like this where people are expressing why they are so passionate about this franchise. So if you're a Star Wars fan, be there. If you're not, there's a good reason to go. And uh, the Blue Star Complex is just, it's my my stomping grounds on the weekends. Uh, been many, many of First Fridays over at the Blue Star Complex. And uh, yeah, it's so great, so wonderful. It's in Southtown, Southtown, San Antonio. Um, head down there early, grab yourself a bite to eat at one of their fantastic restaurants in the area and then after the movie um, hang out afterwards uh, plenty of cool places around there and breweries there's a couple of breweries in Southtown now um, so yeah check those out I love I love that area I will move there one day just don't know when that day might be <laughs> Alejandro thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us uh, you've done it sir congratulations on all that you've accomplished um, even if, you know, folks aren't watching this movie because they live in another state or they're watching this video at a later time, your story is inspiration enough. It, eight years, you, you felt like quitting. You were probably stressed beyond belief and you never stopped. You, you kept going, you persevered. And now you have this film, this amazing film to, to, uh, celebrate, with with the entire city of San Antonio, so congratulations on all your success, and um, we wish you nothing but the best in the Lone Star Wars state. Uh, we'll drop on November 11th in San Antonio. If you're not in the San Antonio area, uh, where can people follow you to find out more about uh, the film and future uh, p potential showings? Yeah, so they can go to Instagram and follow us at in the Lone Star Wars state. Uh, and and they'll be able to get updates and stuff. One last thing I wanted to say. Please, please. There, there is a lot of, uh, it's, it's, it, why in the Lone Star Wars state? So science fiction and, mm. and Western, uh, Western, Western Star Wars inspired a lot by spaghetti Westerns. Right. And uh, there's some roots, we, we talk about that in the movie, there's some roots to Texas uh, within that. And, uh, and so I don't know if you know this, but Princess Leia, when we first see her in A New Hope, she's wearing that white dress with, you know, with her iconic hair. So that was inspired by the women of the Mexican Revolution. And, and if you Google it, you'll see the differences, uh, the, the similarities side by side. So there's a lot of um, connections uh, within science fiction and Texas. And I, I thought that that was so powerful. And also one last thing, um, they say everything's bigger in Texas, and Star Wars is no exception. So. Yeah. That's it. Absolutely. Man. Alejandro, thank you so much again for joining us. And the Lone Star Wars State is going to be shown in uh, less than two weeks now. If you're in the San Antonio or the South Texas area, be sure to get your tickets before they're gone at eventbrite.com. Head on over to our social media pages on Instagram or Facebook. Uh, we'll drop a link on there. Check out our stories. And be sure to check out In the Lone Star Wars State on Instagram.
Uh, good night, everybody. Thanks for watching. And Alejandro, once again, sir, congratulations. Uh, the force is clearly with you. Thank you. With you, too. <laughs>